These are the waters of Lake Van, located in eastern Turkey, a region known to history as Eastern Anatolia. For 26 years, this area suffered the rampaging violence of a civil war and a world war that claimed the lives of nearly two million people. Starting in the 11th century, Turkish tribes from the plains of Central Asia rode westward, defeating the Persians and Byzantines along the way, conquering lands from the Arabian deserts to the Danube River in Europe. These tribes became known as the Ottomans, and their great empire would survive for more than 600 years. The Ottoman Empire spanned from Persia and Arabia to North Africa and Southern Europe ruled by sultans in the great city of Istanbul, a strategic stronghold where Europe met the Near East. Although most of its subjects were Muslim, the Ottoman government guaranteed complete religious freedom for its Christian and Jewish minorities. These communities, known as Milets, were governed to a large extent by their own religious leaders, for centuries, Christians and Jews lived side by side with their Muslim neighbors. Among the empire's many mosques, churches and synagogues also stood in the cities and towns. In the 1800s, European powers began to assert more influence upon Istanbul and to covet Ottoman lands. Under pressure from these great powers, the sultans issued a series of decrees that granted many economic and political concessions. European nations could even issue certificates of protection to Ottoman subjects, making them immune to Ottoman law. In the 19th century, a great wave of nationalism swept across Europe and began to undermine the Ottoman Empire. A series of wars for national independence broke out in southeastern Europe, supported by the great powers. First, Greece broke away, then Serbia, Romania, Bulgaria, and Montenegro. By the start of the 20th century, the Ottoman Empire had lost most of its lands in Europe and North Africa. Great Britain, France, and Russia, driven by their imperialist greed, drove a wedge between the Ottoman Empire's Muslim rulers and their Christian minorities. Western attention soon focused on the Armenians, a Christian people as a useful ally. In ancient times, Armenians once ruled their own kingdom in Asia Minor. Over the next 2,000 years, they spread out across Anatolia and the Caucasus, a distinct minority that contributed much to Ottoman culture and society. It's nonsense to think of the Armenians as an oppressed minority in the Ottoman Empire. They got on very, very well indeed. They had ambassadors, foreign ministers, they ran the banks. The Armenians were known as the most loyal of the Christian communities, the Milets. It's a famous phrase. And uh, they were regarded with a certain amount of hatred even by the Greeks, uh, who thought that they were far too close to the Ottomans. The empire's greatest enemy was Russia, which fought three wars against the Ottomans in the 1800s, capturing land and killing or driving out the Muslim population. On July 13, 1878, the Treaty of Berlin brought peace between Russia and the Ottomans. It also addressed, for the first time, Europe's concern for the Christian Armenians. From that point on, Russia, France, and Great Britain made the Armenian issue their special concern. The Ottomans' belief in religious freedom began to work against them as hundreds of missionaries from Europe and the United States set up schools and hospitals across the empire. They focused their attention on the Armenians. The missionaries brought 
with them uh, some wonderful ideas about knowledge, about hygiene, about social organization, but they also contributed to the splintering of the empire. They contributed to a loss of loyalty by the religious uh, groups toward the central Ottoman government. Many Armenians left the empire and went to schools in Europe and Russia. They caught the fire of socialist revolution and its philosophy that the ends justified the means. In 1887, Armenian expatriates formed the Hinchok Party in Geneva, Switzerland. Three years later, the Tashnak Party was born. Both parties believed that Armenians should fight for their homeland through violent revolution against the Ottoman government. Beginning in the 1890s, we see the emergence of Armenian terrorist groups, such as Hinchok and Tashnak. In today's terminology, just like Al-Qaeda is called a terrorist organization, Armenians had formed a terror organization as well, which committed assassinations and attacks on various places. Hinchak and Tashnak party leaders proclaimed they would launch a campaign of terror against the Turkish and Kurdish people in eastern Anatolia. In Istanbul, British Ambassador Philip Curry reported, the aim of the Armenian revolutionaries is to stir disturbances, to get the Ottomans to react to violence, and thus get the foreign powers to intervene. Fueled by Marxism and nationalism, the Armenian rebels declared war on the Ottoman Empire. In December 1893, Dr. Cyrus Hamlin, a Boston educator, reported that an Armenian revolutionary told him the following, We will kill Turks and Kurds, set fire to villages. Enraged Muslims will rise, fall upon defenseless Armenians, and slaughter them. We are desperate. We shall do it. They had no choice. And consequently, they had better attack the Muslims because the Muslims were attacking them. And this conflict became inevitable. There were no more neutral parties. There were only those who were on the Ottoman side and those who were on the Armenian and the Russian side. Starting in 1894, Armenian revolts broke out in several cities across eastern Anatolia, including Trabzon, Sivas, Erzurum, Bitlis, and Van. The incident was, was always created by the Armenians. I mean, uh, and these were bloody incidents. I mean, they would go and massacre a group of Muslims. Uh, and uh, upon this provocation, uh, the government, or even perhaps uh, the local population, w would go and repress them uh, and massacre a group of uh, Armenians in return. Uh, the important thing for Europe, of course, was that the Armenians were being massacred. Uh, a massacre of uh, Muslims was not very important in their eyes. I mean, they had uh, this, uh, this attitude. Ottoman authorities did retaliate, attacking and killing many Armenians. While the Western press portrayed the Turks as ruthless killers, little was said about the Armenian revolutionaries and the helpless Muslims they slaughtered. They wanted to get the independence uh, of the Armenian people by using force. That was wrong. Because after living side by side for centuries, um, Turks were deeply hurt uh, because of these um, terrorist activities. These Marxist rebels forced many peaceful Armenians into supporting their cause. Those who didn't became targets themselves the Russian diplomat, General Mayevsky, wrote, the unarmed Armenian villagers were forced to help the armed rebels at the cost of their blood. Akdamar Island, surrounded by Lake Van, was a major base of operations for the Armenian revolutionaries. From this Armenian church, they masterminded attacks against Muslim villages, provoking them to retaliate. The rebels attacked policemen and other local officials. Their favorite targets were Kurdish villages, 
Armenians and Kurds had a long history of squabbling over land. This bad blood exploded into violent massacres. The Armenian revolutionaries, sometimes using them, but mainly using their own men from Russia, came in and began to attack Kurdish tribes. Now why in the world would, say, 30 people attack a large Kurdish tribe? The reason is to spark reprisals. You attack a Kurdish tribe, which is armed, which is dangerous. You kill a number of their people that are off herding sheep. You attack a village that isn't protected at the moment. You do something that will allow you to cause a problem and then to escape. The Kurds were not a people to sit still in the face of provocation. They began to kill Armenians. There was a, a great hostility between Kurds and Armenians in some parts of eastern Anatolia. And when the Kurds were brought into the Ottoman Empire, uh, the military forces of the Ottoman Empire, this created a situation where there was a lot of tension between Kurds and Armenians in eastern Anatolia, which could be used by the central government sometimes for, for their own purposes, the, the purposes of the central Ottoman state, and on other occasions it got out of hand. To the rebels, it didn't matter whether innocent Armenians were being slaughtered. Provocation was their goal. If enough Armenians were killed, then surely Russia would send in its troops, or Great Britain, or France. In Istanbul, the Armenian Revolution gained valuable allies, the Armenian patriarchs, chief religious leaders of their people. They supported the fight for an Armenian homeland. It was in their best interest to do so. And the patriarch went on. If you try to set up uh, some kind of national unit, uh, then there will be a horrible backlash from the Turks. So you mustn't do it. Just wait and nobody will come in to save you, especially not the Russians. They don't like us. Now, what is the nationalists' response to their patriarch? They shoot him. The ends continued to justify the means as Armenians took their fight to Istanbul. On August 24th, 1896, a group of Armenian rebels took over the Ottoman bank, chief symbol of the empire's wealth. The incident sparked a riot in the city. About 400 Muslims and 1,700 Armenians died in the violence. Under pressure from Europe, the Sultan pardoned the Armenian rebels, who were granted safe passage out of the country. Sultan Abdul Hamid II, who had been in power for nearly 20 years, was angered by the rebels and their acts of terror and worried that the great powers might intervene in the situation. He ordered his forces to put down the rebellion. The Ottoman army, including Kurdish units known as the Hamidia, launched a merciless attack against Armenian communities. Some of their victims undoubtedly were revolutionaries. Most of them were not. From 1895 to 1897, thousands of Armenians were massacred in eastern Anatolia. These massacres uh, are, were seen as, in a sense, uh, a warning to the Armenians not to organize further and go in the direction that they'd been going before, challenging the Ottoman government and to put aside their uh, demands for reforms, which were feared ultimately would lead to uh, demands for autonomy and independence. In fact, the Hanchakian party's uh, plan did include, uh, ultimately, independence for the Ottoman Armenians. Despite the massacres, Armenian rebels such as General Antranik kept up the fight. From 1901 to 1904, his forces attacked and killed thousands of innocent Muslims. Armenian guerrilla forces, portrayed as freedom fighters in the Western press, kept up the struggle against Ottoman rule. In this effort, Christian missions became military warehouses. These uh, missionary schools uh, started to serve uh, like um, uh, fortresses uh, for the Armenians. Uh, 
they uh, were able to hide their arms, ammunitions in these schools and uh, receive orders uh, from uh, their uh, leaders, from the uh, Revolutionary Committee leaders through these schools. As the great powers moved closer to war, Armenian revolutionaries changed their strategy. The focus shifted from provocations against Muslims to the procurement of arms and ammunition. When war finally did come, the rebels would be ready to help the enemies of the empire. One will find a lot of information and documents on the role of Russia, Great Britain, and France in Armenian rebellions in Anatolia. Their role in organizing and arming Armenian revolutionary bands, forming brigades of Armenian volunteer fighters who they let fight against the Ottoman army. In 1908, radical change swept across the Ottoman political landscape. On July 23rd, the Sultan was forced from power by the Committee of Union and Progress, a coalition of reform-minded politicians and military leaders. The Empire's constitution and parliament, suspended since 1876, were both reinstated. Once again, Ottoman citizens could participate in elections governed by a constitutional monarchy. The parliament passed legislation for political, social, and economic reforms. Even the Armenian Tashnak party agreed to cooperate with the new government in Istanbul. Perhaps political autonomy could be achieved without the use of terror. But reform movements were set aside in Istanbul when the Balkan Wars broke out in October of 1912. Greece, Serbia, and Bulgaria marched against the Ottoman Empire, invading its territories in Europe. Thousands of Muslims were killed or driven out of southeastern Europe as the Balkan armies advanced. A great mass of refugees from the theater of war flowed into the empire. In a horrific prelude to World War I, the Balkans were torn apart by combat, famine, and massacre. In Istanbul, another political force had been gaining momentum, the Young Turk movement. It supported the empire's military leaders, and the Ottoman government became a dictatorship in early 1913, led by a triumvirate of men. Minister of War, Enver Pasha. Minister of Interior, Talat Pasha. And Minister of the Navy, Cemal Pasha. Under their rule, social and political reform continued, even as the empire drew closer to its own demise. The head of the Armenian national delegation, Bogos Nubar, still managed to negotiate some reforms for the Armenian people. But these promises were shattered by the outbreak of World War I. In August 1914, the war that Europe had been waiting for finally arrived. Great Britain, France, and Russia lined up against Germany, Italy, and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Istanbul mobilized its army and waited. Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany had offered military assistance to Enver Pasha and the Ottoman army. Guns, ammunition, and equipment. He also sent German officers to train the empire's soldiers. After war broke out on the continent, the Ottoman army reported increased activity by Armenian rebels. From Paris, the Hinchok party proclaimed that the entire Armenian nation, waving the sword of revolution in their hands, would enter the World War. The First World War broke out in Europe in August 1914. At the time, there was no reason to suppose that the Ottoman Empire would be a part of it, or that the Middle East would be involved in it. 
It was a European affair and not a Middle Eastern one. But um, as, a, as a sort of accident, the Ottoman Empire did come, come into the war. Uh, and though I say an accident, in a sense it was not an accident because it was the, the work of a uh, uh, very talented conspirator and plotter, Enver Pasha, the minister of war in the young Turk government of the Ottoman Empire. Enver Pasha found a way to get into the war. On October 29, 1914, Ottoman warships bombarded several Russian cities on the Black Sea coast. Enver soon devised a plan to attack Russian forces in the Caucasus region. It was a fatal mistake in judgment. In December 1914, the Third Ottoman Army, 95,000 men, began to advance against the Russians. In the mountains of eastern Anatolia and the Caucasus, winters were harsh. Deep snow, freezing temperatures, and rugged landscape. The Ottoman troops, poorly equipped for a winter campaign, followed their orders and marched into a great disaster. At a remote part of the empire, known as Sarakamush, Ottoman troops fought their first major battle of the war. The Third Army attempted to surround the enemy, but the Russians broke out and counterattacked. The campaign was an absolute disaster for the Ottoman forces. Out of 95,000 men, only 18,000 returned to Erzurum in January 1915. I mean, if Armenian nationalists in Van can see these scarecrow troops coming back, their uniforms in rags, you know, with their arms in slings, uh, the shadow of an army that had gone to attack the Russians, the Armenians in Van must have thought, right, well, look, you know, let's do it now, because the Turks are finished. And what, of course, is very remarkable about this country, which observers of the Balkan Wars have noted, the Turks are not finished. They're actually at their best when they've got their backs to the wall. And the British discovered this when they landed in Gallipoli, expecting it to be a pushover. They expected to be in Constantinople in half an hour. On April 25th, 1915, Australian and New Zealand forces landed at Gallipoli on the western side of the Dardanelles Straits. They hoped to capture the capital of Istanbul and take the Ottoman Empire out of the war. The Allies underestimated the influence of German military training and equipment, overseen by General Lehman von Sanders. Nor had they counted on the brilliant Ottoman defense of Gallipoli, led by Colonel Mustafa Kemal. The invaders fought a losing battle for an entire year, trying in vain to gain a foothold and push on to Istanbul. More than 150,000 Allied troops were killed, wounded, or died from disease. Although the Ottomans lost a quarter of a million men, they held their ground and Istanbul was saved. While Ottoman forces beat back an invasion in the west, the Russians drove forward into eastern Anatolia. Fighting alongside them were thousands of Armenian volunteers. The rebels focused their attack on the city of Van. They intended to make it the capital of their new nation. Their opportunity had finally come, strengthened and financed by Russia. Armenian rebels welcomed the Russian attack. The historian Louise Nalbandian wrote that Armenian revolutionary committees considered the most opportune time to start a general rebellion was when the Ottoman Empire was engaged in war. Van was an important city, an important center for the Armenians. And uh, some of the Armenians in 18th and 19th centuries uh, made plans to establish an Armenian state in the Ottoman Empire in Eastern Anatolia under the uh, Russian rule or Russian protectorate. <laughs> 
and one was going to be center of that state. By April 20th, 1915, the Armenians had taken over a large part of the city. A small force of Ottoman soldiers and policemen, led by Governor Jevdet Bey, fought a hopeless delaying action. The battle raged on for nearly a month. Finally, the Ottoman forces withdrew on May 17th. Vaughn fell to the Armenians. As Russians continued their advance into eastern Anatolia, the Armenian rebels set fire to the Muslim quarter of Van. Aram Manukian became the new mayor. According to German observer Johannes Lepsius, the Armenians immediately began to slaughter Muslims. When the Russians arrived in Van on May 19th, they were horrified to find the streets filled with corpses of Muslim civilians. Thousands of men, women, and children cut down by the Armenian rebels. With the exception of two mosques, the entire Muslim part of the city had been utterly destroyed. The Russians, supported by Armenian volunteers, pushed on throughout the spring of 1915 with little resistance. The Ottoman troops were in full retreat from the Russians and could not protect the civilian population from Armenian attacks. One of the rebel leaders, Hamparsum Boyachian, declared, all Turkish children also should be killed as they form a danger to the Armenian nation. The local Armenians rise and they carried out a, a massacre of, you know, of the local Muslims. The five volunteer Armenian regiments had uh, gone over the border and started massacring all the Muslims in sight. And the idea is the straightforward one of ethnic cleansing. You know, if you terrify people, you wipe out villages, then everybody will panic for miles around and run away. This is the theory behind it. At this site, near the village of Zeve, not far from Van, about 2,500 unarmed civilians were massacred by Armenian rebels. They were driven into this natural bowl area and cut down with rifles and machine guns. The civilians could not escape the murderous gunfire of Armenians positioned on the heights above. At Akdamar Island, Muslims fleeing from the horrors around Lake Van sought refuge. But Armenian rebels were waiting and slaughtered their victims without mercy. This Armenian church was the final image seen by many of the Muslims who died there. With rebels in open revolt across eastern Anatolia, the Ottoman government decided to relocate about one-third of the Armenian population to other towns and areas outside the war zone. Istanbul made it clear that Armenian lives and property were to be protected. One decree stated, this order is entirely intended against the extension of the Armenian Revolutionary Committees. Therefore, do not execute it in such a manner that might cause the mutual massacre of Muslims and Armenians. Along their routes of departure, Armenians fell victim to starvation, disease, and massacre by Kurdish tribes and other renegade elements. Local authorities reported these massacres to Istanbul, and the routes of departure were eventually changed to increase safety. Despite these efforts, Tens of thousands of Armenians died in the relocation that lasted from June to November of 1915. Yet most of them survived. According to the Armenian political leader, Bogos Nubar, out of a half million Armenians who left their homes, about 390,000 arrived safely at their destinations. By the summer of 1915, Ottoman forces had regrouped 
and began to counterattack. In 1915, the Russians came in, they took over Vaughn, they took over many other areas, but they were relatively quickly held and then defeated by the Ottomans. They were forced to withdraw. And when they withdraw, the entire Armenian community of all the provinces where the Russians had arrived withdrew with them. They felt that they would be attacked by the Muslims, the survivors, that they would be attacked because they had attacked the Muslims. And so they ran. And when they ran to the Russian Empire, ran along with the Russian troops, they suffered horribly. They suffered starvation. Like the others, they suffered disease. Or in other words, they suffered exactly what the Muslims had suffered just before them. As Russian troops withdrew eastward, Ottoman soldiers and Muslim refugees attacked or killed nearly any Armenian who remained in eastern Anatolia. The Hinchoks and Tashnaks had gotten their morbid wish. Innocent lives were being sacrificed for their cause. Countless atrocities were committed during these times. Women were raped. People were tortured, horribly disfigured, burned to death. Armenian rebels turned their violence into a game. When they found a pregnant Muslim woman, they would bet on whether she carried a boy or a girl. Then they would slit her stomach open to find out. The political struggle of Armenian revolutionaries had turned into an unimaginable bloodbath. Yet far more Muslims and Armenians died of other causes. They had no food and starved to death. They had no shelter and froze to death. They had no medicine and died of disease. Grand Duke Nicholas, uncle of the Russian Tsar Nicholas II, took command of Russian forces in the Caucasus on September 24, 1915. From his headquarters in the city of Kars, Nicholas and his generals regrouped and launched another offensive in January 1916. Throughout that winter and spring, Russian troops drove into Erzurum, Van, Bitlis, Trabzon, and other cities in eastern Anatolia. Nicholas depended on his Armenian volunteers to spearhead the advance, as they were familiar with the territory. At the same time, Armenian revolutionaries disrupted enemy communications and supplies behind the front lines. After a three-day battle, the Russians and Armenians took the city of Erzurum, west of Lake Van, in February 1916. Armenian rebels began to exterminate thousands of defenseless men, women, and children. Their ethnic cleansing would go on for quite some time without any fear of reprisal. The Ottoman army suffered a string of defeats, then launched a counteroffensive in June 1916. They regained some territory, but the Russians drove them back again in August. Many Armenians served honorably in the Ottoman army, fighting and dying for the empire. But others, guided by their nationalist fervor, deserted to the Russians, committed sabotage, and even shot their Muslim comrades in arms on the battlefield. All around Lake Van, Muslims were being killed or driven out. An Armenian officer, Ohanus Apresyan, wrote in his memoirs, We closed the roads and the mountain passes that might serve as ways of escape for the Turks, and then proceeded in the work of extermination. In the city of Bitlis, not far from Lake Van, Russian and Armenian troops attacked in the early morning hours of March 3, 1916. Armenian rebels went through the streets and homes, killing the townspeople. A crowd of Muslims ran to the deserted Russian consulate building for protection. But the Armenian rebels hunted them down and killed nearly every person in the building. 
the Armenians themselves oftentimes are uh, accused by the Ottomans of actually killing or massacring Muslim population. And in fact, the Armenians did uh, do that in 1917 to 1918. Briefly put, the Muslims were all being killed. In cities like Mamahatun, Erzinjan, Erzurum, all the way into that area, Muslims were being killed in all the major cities in whatever countryside they could. The Ottomans finally attacked and came in and took over those areas. And when they did, they found literally streets that were covered with corpses. They found that the wells had been poisoned by the most convenient method, which was to stack them full of dead Turkish males, females, and children. They killed everyone they could find. It must be said that many Armenians who were found after that were killed by the Turks, especially the villagers who came back and found all their families dead. But there weren't very many Armenians who were left. By now, hatred was all-consuming and no one was safe from the terror that gripped the region. In the spring of 1917, Muslim refugees had no reason to hope for a miracle. They were controlled by the Russians and being slaughtered by Armenians. Unknown to the desperate Muslims, help was on the way from a most unlikely source. In Russia, socialist revolution broke out in March 1917. By the end of that year, the Bolshevik party, led by Vladimir Lenin, took over in Moscow and signed an armistice with the Ottoman Empire. We now enter into an area of immense confusion because you had the Ottoman Empire dissolving. But in 1917, with the two Russian revolutions, you had the Soviet, you had, you had Russia also dissolving, Russia, which had been an ally and now was going to be who knew what, but it increasingly it looked like maybe an enemy under the new Bolshevik uh, regime. Just when it looked like the Russians might drive all the way to the Mediterranean, their great military machine ground to a halt. Most of the Russian soldiers who had been occupying Eastern Anatolia simply deserted and went home. They wanted to protect their families. They didn't know what was happening in Russia. They wanted to get out. Initially, the Russian armies that dissolved in Eastern Turkey were replaced by Armenian forces. The Armenians stayed on. Uh, the, the, the Armenians stayed on, but uh, of course they were uh, a small force. Uh, a small force. Uh, it was uh, a hopeless uh, battle. Although the Armenians were now on their own, they kept control over a large part of Eastern Anatolia, and they continued their bloody campaign of ethnic cleansing. The fight for a homeland went on. The massacres went on. As Russian troops went home, the Ottoman forces advanced, recapturing Erzurum in March of 1918. The following month, they took Van and Kars. Everywhere, they found death and destruction left behind by the Armenian forces. Foreign officers serving in this theater would not forget the horrors they witnessed. But some honorable British and Russian officers reported, some of them published. And we see through their um, uh, reports and memorandums how their governments acted. During the war, the great powers sent agents and provocateurs into the Ottoman Empire. The most famous of them was Lawrence of Arabia. Their mission was simple, provoke conflict play upon nationalist aspirations, incite revolt and bloodshed. First of all, they were very well trained how to provoke conflicts between different groups, no matter what. What they needed was armed action. Who kills who was not important. 
While the Ottomans drove the Armenians back in the east, the war was being lost to the British in Palestine, Syria, and Iraq. In October 1918, the Allies captured Damascus and Beirut. By the end of the month, the Ottoman Empire surrendered and signed an armistice with the great powers of Europe. On November 13th, two days after Germany surrendered, an Allied fleet arrived off Istanbul. In the west, the Ottoman army began to lay down their arms. At the Paris Peace Conference the following year, Armenian leader Bogos Nubar reminded the great powers that Armenians had fought on their side. 150,000 Armenians had served in the Russian army. Even after the armistice, European leaders still supported Armenian troops and Greek troops in their fight against the Ottomans. In the years 1919 to 1920, the great powers sat down at the Paris Peace Conference to divide up the world. Armenians, too, tried to establish an independent Armenia at this juncture. There was a grand Armenia project which extended from Chukarova to Yerevan. Great Britain and France, in order to preserve their protectorate system they built in the Middle East, wanted to instigate the Greeks in the West and the Armenians in the East against the Turkish nation. In the face of invasion from Greeks in the West, Armenians in the East, as well as French and Armenian forces in the South, Mustafa Kemal, hero of the Battle of Gallipoli, decided to fight back. Landing at the northern Turkish city of Samsun on May 19, 1919, he rallied the remaining Ottoman troops and forged them into a new fighting force, a Turkish nationalist army. The Turks were determined to save their homeland from dismemberment by the foreign powers. Mustafa Kemal called upon other Turkish leaders to join him. What he did after that, he called two congresses, one at Erzurum for the eastern provinces, which were threatened by an invasion from the Armenian Republic, led by General Antranik, uh, which was causing a great deal of damage, which was killing a lot of Turks in northeastern Turkey. Uh, this has been reported on by American, the American missions there and by British missions that these Armenian troops were killing a lot of Turks. At the Sivas conference, Mustafa Kemal rejected the armistice signed with the great powers, which gave away most of the Ottoman Empire. This new coalition declared a war of independence against all enemies who would destroy their nation with war and massacre. After 1918, Armenian bands, terror organizations, and Armenian soldiers fighting in the Russian army committed large-scale massacres in the regions occupied by the Russians. As the Russians began to retreat in the Igdir region alone, they committed massacres in 21 villages. Besides the invading Greeks in the west and Armenians in the east, Mustafa Kemal had to deal with a third front in the south, where Armenians continued their slaughter with the help of France. Landing in the Mediterranean in late 1918, the French used Armenian rebels in capturing the city of Adana. There they pushed northward. An Armenian legion had been formed, and it immediately began to attack the Muslim population. The French have a very important role in the clashes between the Turks and Armenians in southeastern Turkey, the Kukurova and Cilicia regions. Thousands of Armenian volunteer fighters wearing French uniforms fought against Turks. French archival documents verify this, not only ours. The French promised their Armenian forces that Adana and the surrounding region, known as Cilicia, would become part of a great Armenian nation. But their plans backfired. The Armenian legion committed so many atrocities against the Muslims that it had to be disbanded. <laughs> <laughs> 
The dream of an independent Armenian state in Cilicia was shattered by the advance of Kemalist forces. The French and Armenians had to withdraw and the Turks reclaimed the region. But on the Armenian question, a very powerful man still stood in their way. The great powers called upon President Woodrow Wilson of the United States to accept a mandate over territories claimed by the Armenians. It would be a way of including the Americans in the final breakup of the Ottoman Empire. Wilson's heart was with the Armenians. A devout Christian, he sympathized with their desire to separate themselves from their Muslim neighbors. In the fall of 1919, Wilson sent General James Harbord on a fact-finding mission to eastern Anatolia and the Caucasus region. Harbord and his commission spent six weeks in the area, evaluating the state of affairs regarding Turks and Armenians. General Harbord from United States uh, was sent to observe, uh, analyze the situation uh, in eastern Anatolia in order to search whether an Armenian mandate can be established or not. And uh, in his report, he also stressed that Armenians were not majority in any part of eastern Anatolia. And that statement was an important factor not to take an Armenian mandate by the American government. During his mission, Harbord learned of the horrible massacres that had been committed and were still being committed. He also discovered that most of the victims were Muslim. The conclusion of uh, the report was not really for or against the mandate. The General Harbord uh, wrote 12 reasons for and 12 reasons against why the United States should or could accept the mandate. And this was debated uh, at the Congress, and uh, the Congress, something like 57 to 26 votes, voted against uh, the U.S. mandate in Eastern Anatolia. General Harbord reported to his superiors that while good reasons existed for an Armenian mandate, compelling reasons also existed for rejecting the idea. One reason stood out among all others. The Armenians did not even come close to being a majority in eastern Anatolia. The area was mostly populated by Muslim refugees who had suffered unspeakable horrors since the start of World War I. Yet their suffering was ignored by the West. Instead, they focused relief efforts on the Christian Armenians, raising millions of dollars for food, supplies, and clothing. As for the Muslims, they were on their own. And the Armenians sent their army to invade uh, other parts of the Caucasus and invade eastern Anatolia or eastern Turkey. Uh, they were met by the army of, led by Kazım Karabekir, part of the Turkish National Army that was led by him. There were battles. Uh, Kazım Karabekir defeated them, pushed them all the way back into to Yerevan, and uh, forced, they forced the Armenian Republic to sign a separate peace agreement with the Ottomans at Kars. Armenian troops retreated toward the Yerevan province in the Caucasus, leaving Turkish soldiers to count the bodies of slaughtered Muslims, including 10,000 at Erzurum, 9,000 at Sarakamish, 25,000 at Kars, and more than 70,000 at Nachivan. Our archives reveal that in Anatolia, after the end of World War I, a total of 529,000 Turks were massacred by Armenians. All these dead are accounted for by name and their village, so we can provide even the names of those killed. The Turkish army drove Armenian rebels back toward Yerevan, and a treaty was completed in the town of Gumra on December 3, 1920. The tragic cycle of attack and massacre was finally coming to an end. Two years earlier, 
the Armenians established a republic in the Caucasus, with Yerevan as the capital. But their freedom was to be short-lived. The Armenian revolutionaries and nationalists had fought on the side of the Allies, only to suffer their betrayal in the end. Their dream of a new Armenian nation stretching from Adana to Yerevan had been a tragic illusion. This is all part of the rivalry between these different powers, which didn't want to see one or the other in control. They all cut separate deals ultimately with the Turkish nationalists when they saw that the Sultan's government uh, was no longer a viable force and the Armenians were left, in a sense, uh, in the lurch. More Armenians died and ultimately the Armenians who were left living under Turkish control all emigrated. Now then comes the big Armenian emigration. It's not 1915, it's 1920 when hundreds of thousands of Armenians, fearing retribution, uh, when the French collapse in south southeastern Turkey, fled on French ships and went to North Africa, eventually to Marseilles, perhaps to the Lebanon, perhaps to French Syria. Uh, that's when the real immigration happens from Turkey. In Ankara, Mustafa Kemal and his nationalist government were encouraged by the end of conflict with Armenia and the withdrawal of supporting British forces that had landed in the Caucasus. But in the west, the Greek army had advanced deep into Anatolia. In August 1922, Kemalist forces launched a counteroffensive. The Greek forces retreated to the coastal regions, killing thousands of Muslim citizens along the way. At Izmir, Greek troops were evacuated, along with many refugees, by Allied ships. Suddenly, the city began to burn. Half of it was destroyed. The British quietly surrendered Istanbul in November 1922. Finally, Turkey was free from invasion. The, the Greek army uh, ran away, literally uh, ran away. Um, and, and, and so the, this new treaty, uh, called the Treaty of Lausanne, because it was signed there, was uh, put into force, uh, which resulted in, in uh, Turkey gaining not only the whole of Anatolia, but also eastern Thrace as well. In the Swiss city of Lausanne, the Allies finally made peace with the Turks. A treaty was signed on July 24, 1923. The Armenian delegates to the conference and their claims to Turkish territory were ignored. So uh, all these states slowly dropped the Armenian issue. So when the Lausanne Treaty uh, or Lausanne uh, Conference was held, uh, the Armenian issue was not brought up. Uh, the Armenian delegations were not invited. In this building at Ankara, the first parliament of the Turkish Republic convened. The Ottoman Empire was officially dead. On October 29, 1923, Mustafa Kemal became the first president of the Turkish Republic. He extended the offer of citizenship to any former resident of the Ottoman Empire, including Armenians. So with the Lausanne, it was established that Turks had uh, their own nationality and uh, national state. So uh, with the Armenians, it was the other way around because then they were occupied by the Russian troops, communist troops, Armenia, and then they lost their country. The Armenian nation was short-lived. The Soviets signed a treaty with Turkey and the Republic of Armenia fell under communist rule. The Armenians, I must say, are, were never happy with that treaty. The Armenians claim that the, 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 the Treaty of Moscow sold them down the river. And I think, well, in that sense, they're right because it didn't give them what they wanted, which was Eastern Turkey. Not until 1991 would Armenia gain its real independence. When World War I began, about one and a half million Armenians lived in the Ottoman Empire. By 1922, the League of Nations estimated that nearly 900,000 Armenians had emigrated to Europe, the United States, and many other countries. The remainder, about 600,000 people, had lost their lives to famine, disease, exposure, and massacre 
But the Muslims had fared far worse, losing more than a million people in eastern Anatolia. More than 500,000 of them, men, women, and children, were massacred by Armenian soldiers, rebels, and civilians. The majority of Armenians in the Ottoman Empire had no interest in revolution, but they had been forced to choose sides in a deadly game. In later years, these rebels who sacrificed so many lives for their cause must have asked themselves a question during those sleepless nights when they were haunted by memories of their victims. They must have asked themselves, was our dream really worth the cost?